In the Gears of War universe, the Hollow Creatures, also known as the Denizens of the Hollow, were a diverse group of indigenous animals found within the Hollow, which was an underground tunnel network beneath the planet Sarah. As the Locust Horde developed their civilization in the depths of Sera, many of these creatures were used for multiple purposes to serve the Locust. Many of them were genetically engineered, other creatures were also used as a food source for the Locust Horde, and used by the Locust as vehicles, machines and weapons of war. So I'm your host Abs, and in this lore video I'll be explaining every single hollow creature in the Gears of War universe. So make sure to drop a like and consider subscribing if you do enjoy the video. Now then, the Hollow Creatures of Sarah. So the Locust Tickers were creatures that were found in the hollow on Sera that the Locust used as a mobile landmine by strapping emulsion tanks onto them. So the Tickers, they were named after the ticking sound they make while scurrying across the battlefield. They are small creatures that somewhat resemble a cross between a rodent and a reptile. They're only 2 foot in length on average, so they are pretty small but they are deadly. Tickers are always seen in large numbers and are used mainly as mines against cog vehicles. So the Locust's primary use of tickers was to essentially use them as suicide bombers. However, the Locust used them against cog ground troops as well, an example of this being the Cantus, which summoned two tickers at a time and used them as a last defense when under direct threat by cog units. Tickers are quick moving and relatively difficult to detect despite the sounds they emit, making them dangerous and unpredictable adversaries, especially in large groups. And due to the gas released by tickers when about to explode and the tanks mounted on their backs, it would of course be due to the emulsion that is used to cause the explosions. Tickers also have claws and they are capable of eating weapons and ammunition as well. Tickers also appear to have no eyes and this could be because they live in dark caves. In the real world, cave creatures have also evolved like this and this would explain the ticking noise they make, which is similar to how bats see in the dark by detecting objects using sound. Alternatively, it could just be their teeth clicking away given their jittery behaviour. Now we also have the wild tickers, but these are essentially normal tickers that haven't been recruited into the locust military and strapped with an emulsion tank. The main weapon of the wild tickers would be its claws, but they are considerably weak. I guess you could say these are tickers that haven't been tamed, and the wild tickers would be the tickers true form of how they were in the hollow, just really small grey skinned reptile like creatures that lived in the hollow and probably scavenged around for food. The savage locust also had a ticker assembly line where they would attach tickers to a moving rail and strapping them with emulsion tanks. Many tickers were also seen in cages, so the locusts didn't exactly treat the tickers well, so I kind of feel bad for the little guys in a way, because they were just living their life in the hollow, doing their thing, and locust just took them and recruited them into their military, so I kind of feel bad for them in a way. And there was also a cutscene where there was a group of savage locusts that were watching a ticker pit fight, so I guess tickers were also used for entertainment purposes for the locust horde as well. Referred to as a monkey dog by Benjamin Carmine, the wretch was a hollow creature that the Locust Horde used as cannon fodder. They were small wiry hunched creatures that excelled in swarm and ambush tactics. On their own, a wretch could easily overpower an average human, but they stood little chance one on one against a gear, armed or unarmed. So the wretch's role within the Locust Horde was to act as cannon fodder for their army emerging from emergence holes in vast numbers to attack the local population of every city the locust attacked, feasting on any human they could prey upon. Wretches were relatively intelligent and able to manipulate unsuspecting soldiers and civilians into traps. They were extremely versatile in movement, able to crawl and cling to most surfaces. They were relatively weak to gunfire when compared with other locust creatures, but they made up for it with sheer numbers. Wretches were only 3 foot 1 in height, so they weren't very large, but they were always a nuisance to cog soldiers. 
weaponizing their claws, teeth, and they had a deafening screech. Chainsawing a wretch with your handy lancer is always an easy option, but unfortunately it will leave you vulnerable to the other wretches since they like to hunt in packs. Your trusty Nasha shotgun is always a safe bet to get these guys out of their misery, or you can actually kill them relatively easily with 1-2 to two melee hits. This also shows the brute strength of your average COG soldier, as the majority of COG gears are absolute freaks of nature, they're not like your average humans. Unfortunately, due to the parasitic fungus known as emulsion that existed on Sierra, some wretches had endured a prolonged exposure to emulsion, turning into lambent wretches, and these were the actual first lambent species known to the COG. Due to the emulsion, their body colour had also changed to black charred skin, infected with yellow emulsion bioluminescent boils. Lambent wretches are volatile and considerably tougher than a standard wretch in both attack and durability. And of course, these wretches would have been associated with the lambent and not the locust. So these wretches would have attacked humans and locust as well. Now, the wretches are actually the first locust we ever encounter in Gears of War. And the lambent wretch is the first lambent we ever encounter. So I thought that's a pretty cool fact, to be honest. And during the development of the first Gears of War game, the wretch had a previous design when the locust were originally going to be named the Geist. So the wretch Geist was of course scrapped, for the locust wretch that we've known throughout the Gears of War series. corpses as well as many of the hollow creatures were eventually tamed by the locust horde as tools for war and the corpses were enhanced by the locust head scientist Ukon. The corpses were used to dig tunnels all across Sera, allowing locust forces to move undetected and even behind cog lines. The Jacinto Plateau which was positioned atop a solid granite plateau was the only place on Sierra that the Locust could not use corpses to dig through. Even though corpses were more strategic than offensive, they were still considered very very dangerous and they were known to track and stage ambushes, hinting at a relatively high level of intelligence or instinct. And the corpses were around 36 feet tall on average and they were extremely durable and they had grey and white skin. Corpses were often seen moments before Locust attacks and often symbolised the Locust's emergence on E-Day. And at some point during the seventh cycle of the Lambert War, Volkan discovered a deformed corpser with a missing leg and decided to nurture it, and he called this the Shibboleth. Volkan then requested that Ukon help mend and modify the Shibboleth. Ukon not only devised a metal leg for the Shibboleth, but he also modified it with armour plating, troikas, emulsion bombs, and designed it with the ability to expel nemesis and diggers as well as to breathe fire as well. The shibboleth was unique in that it had claws very close to that of an infant corpse, one of which is a mechanical prosthetic, and with the ability to launch nemesis. Shibboleth was extremely unique in that it appeared to serve the locust, or at least Khan, on its own free will, rather than being broken and forced into servitude like some of the other animals. It is unknown if the Shibboleth was unique or if there were others of its kind, and we don't know if there were corpse mutations like the Hydra which was the result of mutating Reavers, we don't know if there was the same thing for that but for the corpses. Although much of the corpse population was wiped out after Operation Hollow Storm in the Locust War, when the ancestral home of the Locust was sunk, a sizable number of corpses did manage to escape but they became wild. Some of them were found by the savage locust and kept in captivity to be bred and tamed for battle in the Deadlands. Delta Squad later confronted a number of these corpses as they made their way through savage locust territory. Unfortunately, Delta Squad accidentally stumbled into a corpse and nest and a hatchling burst out of one of the eggs but it was killed when it attempted to attack them. The death of its offspring enraged the mother corpser, who was absolutely huge, who let out a roar which caused the other eggs to hatch. Now Delta fought off the hatchlings and the mother corpser appeared to face its offspring's killers. Presumably, corpses sexually reproduced like most creatures on Sera, by nature, meaning they lay eggs rather than give live birth. They normally hatch on their own time, 
but are capable of hatching on their mother's call, usually to defend the nest. When corpses are born, they're actually quite small and frail by adult standards, roughly coming up to the size of a large siren dog in comparison. They were also quite pale and most likely blind at this stage of development. However, they probably possessed acute hearing or smell out of the shell, given Delta's battle with the corpse and nest in their journey across the Deadlands. Now, corpses were born with four fingers, if you want to call it that, and given the difference between a corpse hatchling, the Deadlands mother corpse, and the militarized adult corpse, corpses most likely grew more claws the older they got up to a total of 8 at adulthood. They also grew in size, strength and durability as expected for most animals. Even at adolescence, corpses were remarkably sturdy, capable of taking a motorized chainsaw to the face and still living to fight another day. And after the activation of the emotion countermeasure weapon in 17 years after emergence day, which ended the locust war, all of the locust and the lambent were killed so it is unknown if any corpses survived or whether or not they evolved into members of the swarm. There's our ticket out of here! Get on those reavers! Marcus, I don't think they're gonna let us just climb on them. You got a better idea? Let's ride, Delta! Always wanted me a little horse. There's a fly one. They ain't cool, but let's just get the fuck out of here. Let's go. So the Reaver was a large flying creature utilized by the Locust Horde that also possessed the ability to walk on the ground. They could carry one pilot and one additional passenger and they were armed with a variety of weapons. They were used by the Locust to suppress the COG's air support and dominate the gears on the ground. So the Reaver's body structure and resulting function is complex, especially in the matters of how it is able to fly. The Reaver's raptor-like head is small in comparison to its large body, which is tough with several tentacles in the back which probably act as the Reaver's flying limbs. Reavers actually lived in the hollow, so they were one of the many indigenous subterranean creatures that lived in the hollow. So Reavers were 10 feet tall in height and around 10 to 15 feet in length. They also had black and grey skin as well. There are also two small hook shaped limbs on the reaver's belly and their tentacles are powerful of which reavers can attack with as well. Their tentacles also have a gland that can secrete an oily mist to obscure visibility and maybe one of the ways the reaver could help ink the sky from Hammer of Dawn Strikes alongside the Nemesis. Now reavers may fly with lighter than air gas like gas barges which explains their violent explosion upon death. Reavers serve as flying vehicles for the locust deployed to launch quick bloody raids against the humans and reinforce faltering locust attacks or defensive lines. Like I said the Reaver has two seats, one for the pilot and one for the gunner, the latter being either a standard drone or a more threatening Theron guard. Also Reavers do have little to no armour but they do have very very tough skin, making them difficult to kill but not impossible. They also have a small red bulge located on their underbelly and this spot is vulnerable and if a gear can manage to bypass the reaver's weaponry and tentacles, they can kill it with relative ease. And like many weapons in the Gears of War universe, the reaver has several affiliation lights on their saddle and helmet that will become blue or red in relation to the pilot's affiliation, so whether it's cog or locust. So as you can see in this early concept art, the reaver's original name was actually the Geist Reaper, because back during development of Gears of War 1, the Locusts were originally going to be called the Geist, so the Reaver's original name was actually the Geist Reaper, which sounds pretty badass to be fair, but the Locust is an amazing name. So those are the standard Reavers, but there was also the Locust Hydra, and the Hydra was a mutated species of the Reaver. The Hydra was the personal mount of the Locust High Priest Scourge, and the creation of the Locust Scientist Ukon. Ukon created the Hydra through actually mutating Reavers, because as we know, Ukon loved to experiment with different Locust troops to aid the Locust and help strengthen their army and the Hydras were around 50 to 54 feet, so they were huge and they were much more larger and deadlier than the standard Reavers. They acted as a personal mount and gunship, they could shoot missiles and rockets, they had a Troika machine gun attached and they had huge tentacles. Shit, there it is, now what? Now, we piss it off. What? 
Okay, let's roast this thing. Run to the Transformers. Where? Over there. The access road. The fence is open. Run! <laughs> Prison smell bad. So the Brumac was one of the largest species of hollow creature, believed by COG scientists to be the apex predator of the hollow. COG research indicated that they were bred from apes by the locust, which was actually correct as this was done by the locust geneticist Ukon to use the hollow creatures as tools for the locust horde to prosper and to use them as weapons of war. The Brumax would often grow to about 12 plus meters in height, which is about 40 feet tall, and weigh around 10,000 kilograms. These huge monsters had extremely thick hides, even without their heavy armor. Unlike the Corpser, which was another hollow creature, the Brumax only had two eyes, but their helmets are covered in luminescent lenses, giving the illusion that they had more than two eyes, but they only had two. So the locust geneticist Ukon created the armor for the Brumax and the other hollow creatures that the locust horde used and he also designed the helmet technology that allowed the locust to control these hollow creatures. Because without the helmets, the creatures become rogue and just as dangerous to the locust as they would be to their enemies. Now the Brumax were equipped with wrist mounted chain guns and a back mounted rocket launcher, making them extremely deadly at both close and long range. And they possessed incredible strength capable of pushing over an assault derrick with a single shoulder shove. So these giant reptilian-like creatures were enslaved by the locust and used in battle as massive sentient tanks. And despite several sightings of locusts riding on the backs of these beasts, no humans had ever attempted to ride one until Marcus Phoenix and Dominic Santiago during the last hours of the sinking of Jacinto City. So the role that the Brumac played in the locust army was a tactical one, being deployed to act as a walking arsenal, laying waste to any and all human forces in its path. It used its weapons to devastate human military forces and level infrastructure. And when the Locust Horde invaded a city, the Brumac was used to cause heavy casualties and large amounts of destruction. And besides offensive purposes, Brumacs have been seen in and around the Locust Capital Nexus, being used for defensive purposes, in this case, protecting their city. So those were the original Brumax, and then we also had the Lambent Brumax. So the Lambent Brumax was the result of a Brumax coming into direct contact with emulsion or emulsion vapors and becoming heavily mutated. So its mutation and mutation results are vastly different from other Lambent lifeforms. The Lambent Brumax grew several stories tall, coming in between 98 to 140 feet tall, with its head splitting open, with a second one coming out of it, and with multiple huge tendrils coming out of its body. It was so heavily mutated that it did not appear remotely similar to a Brumac any longer. And of course, the Lambent Brumac being killed triggered a massive explosion on a huge scale, and the Lambent Brumac was substituted for the light mass bomb in order to sink Jacinto City and flood the hollow, which was the home of the Locust, with seawater. And then we also had the Swarmax, so the Swarmax were horribly disfigured versions of the Brumac, being covered with numerous blisters and heavy crystal growth and appeared roughly 25 years after the end of the Locust War. Swarmax, much like Scions, seemed to be former Brumax that were killed when the Emulsion Countermeasure weapon was activated 17 years after Emergence Day, since they seemed to share the same crystal growth that the Scions had as drones when they died. And the Swarmax are the same height as the original Brumax, but they have gold locust shell crystals with grey skin and they are covered in orange bioluminescent blisters. And much like regular Brumax, the Swarmax carried two chain guns on its wrist and a rocket launcher mounted on its back. But unlike the regular Brumax, the Swarmax were much more difficult to kill. The reason being was because of their crystal growth, preventing them from taking heavy damage. However, Swarmax had blisters covering their body and this was their weak spot 
and destroying all of these blisters would kill the Swarmak. Now these blisters were very durable and could take a lot of punishment before being destroyed, but it is unknown as to how these blisters came to be. And when the blisters were destroyed, the Swarmak would be severely hurt, much like a normal Brumax chain guns exploding on it. Alternatively, a Swarmak could be killed by ripping its mouth open, though it had to be incapacitated first. between here and Azura at full readiness and make sure we don't lose him again. God damn it, she's still alive? How the hell did she survive the flood? So, she's still running the show. Holy shit! Look at the size of that book! Mm, I got your number, bitch. So the Tempest was a large flying locust creature and the personal mount of the Locust Queen Mirror. Resembling a giant flying beetle clad in golden armour, it was the royal mount that was seen in Gears of War 3 where the Tempest stalked Delta 1 throughout their journey to reach Adam Phoenix in their attempt to end the Lambent Invasion. It also had the ability to summon multiple Locust Shriekers. So the Tempest was a massive flying beetle-like creature from the Hollows of Sera. So before the time of the Locust Horde, the Tempest would have been assumed to be one of the major predators in the Hollow due to its mobility, durability, size and offensive abilities. The Tempest had four legs, four wings and a mouth that could shoot a powerful beam of intense light that literally lit everything that it hit on fire. So the Tempest when encountered was an absolute force to be reckoned with. When the Tempest came into the ownership of Queen Mirror, the Tempest was suited up with a set of golden armour. This armour was so thick and well built that only the Hammer of Dawn could kill it, very much similar to a Berserker, which shows how durable the Tempest and its armour was as it needed multiple blasts from an orbital satellite based laser to take it down. Now it is unknown if the Tempest was the only one of its kind, or if there were others like it, but if it was the only one of its kind, you could assume that the Locust used their geneticist work to create the Tempest. Now this is just speculation, but the reason why I'm saying this is because Ukon, the Locust geneticist, was the mastermind behind the Locust Hydra, which he created through mutating the Reavers, who were another form of hollow creature. And the Hydra was used as the personal mount for Scourge and Ukon himself. So the Tempest, being a mutated, genetically engineered royal mount for Mirror, doesn't seem too far-fetched. Although that is my own speculation, it would be interesting to know more about the Tempest's origins. During the development of Gears of War 3, the Tempest was originally called the Locust Dreadnought, before it was renamed to Tempest. The Tempest also had the ability to summon Shriekers, and the Shriekers appear to be the Tempest's offspring due to their resemblance to the Tempest and the fact that the Tempest spawns them. So, what are the Shriekers? So a Shrieker was another type of hollow creature that appeared during the Locust Human War and the Lambent Invasion. As the name suggests, they make a very harsh shrieking noise. They were very small creatures with height of around 1 foot that floated in mid-air and had a reddish pink glow. The Locust Horde equipped the Shriekers with modified Gorgon SMGs which made them formidable foes. But in their homeland in the Hollow, before being taken into the Locust Army, you'd assume they wouldn't have been as harmful given that they would have lived without these Gorgon SMGs and the armour. Shriekers were bioluminescent and had the ability to float above the ground flawlessly. It's possible that they used methane to stay afloat, explaining their flammability, but despite their size, they were surprisingly formidable opponents with their swarm tactics, considerable agility and surprising accuracy. It is highly likely that the Shrieker is an infant juvenile Tempest, seeing as how it only appears being spawned from the back of the Tempest, which would in fact make sense given their biological similarities to the Tempest. Giant it is! Just means a bigger target! 
Cerapedes or giant cerapedes were creatures native to the planet of Sera and were described as being unlike any other creature on the planet. They were notable for their steel-like carapace, their ability to shoot globs of acidic poison from their mouths and most notably they had the ability to shoot lightning from its pincers. So cerapedes were 15 feet in length and were some of the more unique wildlife on the world of Sera. Each cerapede was armoured in an extremely durable metallic shell which protected it from most offensives. A notable thing about the creature's anatomy was the fact that it possessed the genus of Electrophorus, giving it the ability to release an electrostatic discharge from the electrocytes in their pincers, being proficient enough for offensive and defensive capability. The normal cerapede was pretty common and not very large and seen throughout Sera as evidenced by coalition soldier Dizzy Wallin during the Battle of Endeavour Naval Shipyard. But in the Locust War, the Locust Horde corrupted Cerapedes with emulsion to make them larger and deadlier, to make them weapons in their army, becoming giant Cerapedes. They were of course deadlier weapons under the Locust as they were forced through evolution against their will. The Cerapedes armour allows it to be used to distract the enemy whilst other Locusts move in its electric attack is more effective on infantry than it is on structures. However, do keep an eye out on the glowing green tail, as this is the Cerapede's only weak spot, so to damage a Cerapede, the glowing green tail needs to be damaged significantly. To totally exterminate the bug, humans have to shoot it apart one abdomen at a time. Now, the name Cerapede itself comes from a combination of the word centipede and the name of the planet Sera, where Gears of War takes place. The Mongolian Deathworm is a creature reported to exist in the Gobi Desert and as the Cerapede has a worm-like appearance and is said to spit acid and discharge electricity, it could be said that the Mongolian Deathworm, although reports are disputed or unconfirmed, could have inspired the Cerapede biology. They found us! So in Gears of War, the Blood Mount was a hollow creature that the Locust Horde rode atop. They are large, bulky creatures that remain low to the ground, and they have a unique physiology in that they use their large muscular arms as legs. So essentially, they're actually walking on their hands. Their true legs dangle beneath their bodies and end in razor-sharp talons, which they use as their primary form of attack. The blood mounts are usually accompanied by a rider and these are known as beast riders. So the beast riders were locust drones that rode on a blood mount, reaver or even the brumac. The beast rider was a dreaded enemy that inflicted heavy casualties on the gears. But the blood mounts can also be seen with other riders too at times, for instance Theron guards or even locust grenadiers. So the blood mounts, similar to the corpses and the brumax, were from the hollow, but just like the other hollow creatures like the corpses and the brumax, the locusts were able to control these creatures. Although the reason as to how they were controlled by the locust has never been fully explained as of creating this video, it could be due to the designed helmet technology that allowed the locusts to control them. Without the helmets, the creatures become rogue and just as dangerous to the locust as they would be to their enemies. And it is likely that the locust lead scientist Ukon was responsible for this helmet technology and the ability for the locust horde to control these hollow creatures. A little bit of trivia which I thought was pretty cool is that in Gears 2's horde mode, if a blood mount takes enough damage or sometimes if its rider is killed, the blood mount will momentarily stop to remove its headgear and this allows the player to finish off killing other enemies or finish off the blood mount itself and when this happens we actually get to see how a blood mount looks without the headgear and I think that's pretty cool to see how it looks without the headgear so I thought I'd include that there. I also want to talk about the blood mount stables so these were where the blood mounts were kept so the blood mount stables were the holding area for the blood mounts used by the locust beast riders and the three Theron ranks have all been seen to ride these as well and presumably use these stables. These stables are only actually seen in Gears of War 2 because of the introduction of the blood mounts and it is quoted by Augustus Cole and seen by Delta Squad that human heads were fed to the blood mounts for sustenance. And this along with many other reasons would be as to why the locust took human prisoners. One reason of course being of the newfound use of blood mounts. Now during Operation Hollow Storm, Delta encounters the blood mount stables which were full of beheaded human corpses which was the blood mount's food 
The blood mounts inside try to attack the gears through the bars but they're actually unable to harm Delta Squad. Now these stables were located at the bottom of the Locust Palace near a lift that was the back way entrance. And the fact that humans were used as food for the blood mounts is absolutely crazy. And throughout Act 4 Chapter 2 you can see mangled bodies seen on operating tables and it's just crazy, the locusts, they're absolutely brutal. They'd literally just chop off human heads and serve them to the blood mounts. Crazy stuff. And the blood mounts held in these pens seem particularly aggressive and will attempt to attack the player through the bars. And you can actually choose to kill the blood mounts in the stables or not, but it makes no difference to the actual game, as the blood mounts are unable to escape unless of course the cage is opened. Now it remains unknown if the blood mounts survived the emotion countermeasure weapon which was activated 17 years after emergence day. So if the blood mounts did survive, like other hollow creatures like the Brumax, it remains unknown as to if they went through metamorphosis too. And if they did, it will be interesting to see how they look like now, over 25 years after the end of the Locust War. There's our ride. Let's track it. <sighs> this is the last time I fly with a budget airline. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if you look over the side, you might see Anvilgate, the lovely historic city of Anvagad. It is lovely, right? <laughs> Even Sam says it's the ass end of the world, and it's her hometown. Now, one of the signature creatures that the Savage Locust used were the Locust Cast Barges. And the Locust Cast Barges were huge creatures that can float and propel themselves through the air. And they first appeared on the surface 18 months after the sinking of Jacinto. After the hollow was flooded, the Locust Remnant needed a new strategy to fight off the Cog and Lambent and used the Gas Barges to do so. Gas Barges are able to fly by use of a large floating creature the top half of which holds gas lighter than air. It is crudely manoeuvred by a navigation system connected to a pair of razor sharp spikes thrusting into the creature's sides, causing the creature to move in whatever direction the locust desired. So these spikes are very similar to horse spurs, only scaled up. However, the craft is quite sluggish and large, meaning that they are very easy to hit, unlike the speedier and smaller reavers. Gas barges carry a platform underneath, these sported four boomshot or MK1 lancer fitted multi turrets and two dorsal belly turrets on the port and starboard side for attacking cog forces. The Savage Locust also used these to deploy troops into the fight, so the gas barges were great assault airships for them. The Savage Locust also used Siege Beasts. Now the Siege Beast was a large creature that had been enslaved by the Locust Horde and the Savage Locust as well, and turned into a catapult-like machine. They were known to be used by the Locust during their pre-industrial era and were reintroduced into their armed forces after the flooding of the Inner Hollow. To operate as a catapult, the creature is forcibly strapped into a war machine with its limb continually bent back so projectiles can be launched at enemy positions. Cole commented on how the turkey is very accurate at destroying targets, which it was, and the Savage Locust used the Siege Beasts to deadly effect. The Siege Beast is a creature enslaved by the Locust for use as an artillery piece. It has been mounted on a carriage for better mobility and to stop it from turning on its masters, but its head is still exposed and will bite anything close to it. It is armed with a giant catapult on its back made from its own limbs, and it also appears to be a totally self-sufficient weapon, so to prepare it for firing, the large appendages at the front are wound back and held into position. Then a canister on its back opens and deposits a large ball of explosive organic matter into the cup on the end of the wound limbs. The cupped limbs are then released, creating a huge amount of energy, firing the explosive ordnance accurately, even at long ranges. And it can cause devastating amounts of damage to King Raven helicopters or even a Brumach when hijacked by Cog Gears. No known Saren has seen the Siege Beast before its enslavement to the Horde. 
but like all hollow creatures, they were effectively tamed and later used as war machines by the Lokes Tord. Sometimes it's about knowing when to turn tail and run your fucking ass off. This is it, people! Saddle up! Storm's about to hit. So the krill were highly aggressive carnivores. The krill were small, winged creatures, measuring around 2-3 to three inches in length. Their two eyes also glowed a pale yellow light. So the krill were native to the outer hollow on the planet Sera. Located in the crust of Sera, the hollow is separated between the inner hollow and the outer hollow. So the krill were known to live in the outer hollow, which was closer to the surface compared to the inner hollow, and the outer hollow was explored by humans, after the invention of the light mass process to refine emulsion for fuel. Due to their subterranean nature, krill were extremely photosensitive, with bright sources of light blinding them to the point of physical pain. In fact, krill were so sensitive to light, they even burst into flames whenever they were exposed to ultraviolet light. Krill were nocturnal and as such were most active at night. They slept in safety of the hollow when the sun was out, but once twilight descended, they would begin to emerge from their subterranean warrens in search of food, which was generally anything that left the light, which in this case, would have been other hollow creatures, or probably whatever they could find really. Krill swarmed their prey, devouring it piece by piece, little by little, multiplied a hundredfold, utterly consuming the target until there was nothing left, not even bone. Not even the Lokes Tord was completely safe from the Krill's voracious appetites, though they were often ignored when there was an abundance of humans to feed upon. However, the Locusts have also been known to directly use the Krill, the most prominent example being General Ram, who somehow exerted a sort of control over the Krill, which hasn't been fully explored as to how Ram of all the Locusts had a large amount of control over the Krill. The unidentified Theron elite that accompanied Ram during the evacuation of Alima could also manipulate the beasts, but to a lesser extent. The Locust used the Krill Grenade, which was a weapon used by the Theron elite, and it is considered a more tactical but unsophisticated way of weaponizing Krill in contrast to Ram's symbiotic and mutualistic relationship. Due to this factor, Krill grenades are only gifted to the most elite of Locust and only those under Ram's command given the veracity of the krill. It functioned similar to an ink grenade, but instead of toxic ink, it attracted a swarm of krill to rip apart any humans unfortunate enough to be caught in it. Now, it is unknown how the grenade actually attracts the krill, but it seems that since the evacuation of Lima took place during daylight, the grenade might obscure the area so that the krill can attack the victim. It could also be something in the ink that helps the krill detect its prey, such as a peculiar pheromone that attracts only krill to that particular vicinity. As such, despite similar outward appearances, it is possible that this species of immature nemesis are a special and separate breed. And nemesis were flying organic mortars used by the locust horde. They were released by a cedar's secondary mouth and would make a beeline for the nearest enemy unit. It was deadly against Cog Gear Squads or King Ravens, and Nemesis were used many times by the Locust Horde during the Locust War. One example was when General Ram used Nemesis during his assault on Elima City. Nemesis played a pivotal role during the assault, inking the skies above the city so that it could be cleared from its human population by a Krill Storm. And Krill Storms were when Krill congregated in large numbers, sometimes numbering in the millions and they were considered incredibly dangerous by the coalition of ordered governments, enough to evacuate entire cities if one was seen over the horizon. And by 12 AE, so 12 years after Emergence Day, Krill were becoming more and more common around Jacinto Plateau, which forced the Locust to cut back on their night raids. This caused heavy speculation in the coalition about the origins of the Krill, with Colonel Victor Hoffman guessing that they were an engineered experiment gone wrong, or something else that the Cog did not know about. And at the Tyro Pillar at the end of Gears of War 1, Marcus Phoenix and Dominic Santiago faced off with General Ram, who once again used the Krill as a shield to protect him from weapons fire. Explosives used by the two 
and a searchlight manned by the Coltrane from a nearby King Raven caused the Krill to flee Ram for several moments, leaving him vulnerable to gunfire, though the Krill used these opportunities to attack directly. Eventually, Ram was killed and the Krill fled without his control over them to keep them there. So with the death of General Ram and the detonation of the Lightmass Bomb, which destroyed the Outer Hollow, the Krill's breeding grounds were destroyed and their species became virtually extinct, allowing the coalition to retake the capital Ephira. As a result, Ephira and Stranded could once again roam free in their city without the fear of being eaten alive. It has been hinted that there may have been different species of Krill, but this has never come to light. No pun intended. And the Krill were originally planned to be in Gears of War 2. They were supposed to be in a chapter taking place in a cave filled with glowing maggots that they feed upon. But for unknown reasons, the chapter and any actual Krill appearances were left out. Instead, Epic Games placed a collectible explaining the effects the Lightmas Bomb had on the Krill breeding grounds, which led to their extinction. Riftworms were gargantuan, worm-like creatures that could grow 10 miles in length. They burrowed across the Saren crust, devouring everything in their path and leaving behind a rich manure. The manure then fertilized the soil within the tunnels, later termed as the hollow by humans, and created life underground. An ecology of plant and animal life evolved in the hollow, with many of the creatures being reptilian in nature, just like the Riftworm. Among the many life forms created in the hollow by the Riftworm was Emulsion, a parasitic fungus that was capable of infecting, mutating and possessing any living organism. And at some point in the Gears of War timeline, the Riftworms went dormant in the hollow. The Riftworms were viewed as gods by the Locust Horde for being givers of life. Thus, their main religion based on the Riftworms, known as the Trinity of Worms, was formed. Only three Riftworms have been known to exist, and during the Locust War, one was awakened and used by Keith's Scourge as a weapon of mass destruction, capable of sinking entire cities. And the last known Riftworm was killed in 14 AE, so 14 years after Emergence Day. Now the anatomy of the three Riftworms would have been very different, but the one that we encountered in Gears of War 2 had impenetrable skin from the outside, it had not one, not two, but three hearts. But luckily for the Sirens, it was killed by Delta Squad in 14 AE. There were also the Nemesites that lived inside the Riftworm. So the Nemesite was a bipedal enemy only found within the Riftworm. So it wasn't seen anywhere else. The Nemesite is the Riftworm's secondary means of destroying living organisms within its stomach area. The primary force being its digestive teeth. They are medium sized, about the size of a Gear soldier, being 6 feet from head to tail. Their bodies consist of a rounded trunk with two large pincer-like legs used for movement. For stability, the Nemesites have a tail that extends from their body and trails behind them as they crawl along on their legs. The Nemesite is spawned from small holes inside the Riftworm's stomach and usually travel in small groups, consisting of only three or four at a time. They move quickly and once they begin attacking, they are hard to remove as they attempt to eat their prey. Nemesites, however, are incredibly weak health-wise. A small burst from the Lancer Assault Rifle is enough to kill them. 
They seem to live just under the surface of the worm's stomach, emerging from holes that open up in the ground. They also appear to have some acidic based quality, as Benjamin Carmine seemed to have acid all over him after being mauled by them. But this could be because he was thrown into the worm's digestive tentacles that cover most of its stomach. You got it. Sam and Carmine are on their way. Now diggers were small burrowing creatures enslaved by the savage locust for use as explosive projectiles that are fired from the digger launcher, which was equipped by the savage boomers. When fired, they burrow under the ground behind cover, then pop up and explode in the air, killing the enemies in that cover. They can burrow through dirt, rock and wood. And when fired into a target, the digger will latch onto the target and chew into its chest before exploding inside the victim. Now heart leeches were native creatures that also lived in the hollows. They are not part of the locust horde, and their existence was known to the human race during the Pendulum Wars. Heart leeches kill by embedding themselves into their victim's chest and slowly tearing open their ribcage. The heart is then devoured inside the chest cavity as the leech then exits the deceased victim, which is why they are called heart leeches. Now during the mission to Montevado, Jay Stratton and Dominic Santiago walked into a heart leech nest, unfortunately. But they killed several of them and blew up an emulsion tank that burnt several more, but they were in danger of being overrun. However, they were saved by Marcus Phoenix and Michael Barrick, and all of the heart leeches were killed. In both appearance and behaviour, the heart leeches share many similarities with the swarm leech. The swarm leech will burrow into a human's torso and explosively emerge back out, killing the human. So it is possible, but currently unknown, if the swarm leech is a descendant from the heart leeches. It started! Let's go, Dad. This tower's too unstable now. I'm sorry, Marcus. I'm not going to make it. It's okay. I'll carry you. Marcus, the emulsion developed faster in me because I forced it to. I had to find out how it reproduced. What are you talking about? Oh, shit. No. You are not going to die. It's too late, Marcus. Every cell in my body is breaking down. And this is going to happen to every contaminated cell on Seraph. It has to. No, goddammit, I can't lose you again. I'm glad I was able to see you again, Marcus. Now go and live for me. God! Now emulsion was a parasitic fungal organism that appeared as a naturally occurring, luminescent, golden, highly volatile liquid. It was found in geological formations beneath Sarah's surface, known as the hollow. It was commonly refined into a fuel source and became the most sought after resource on the planet. Emulsion was mostly recovered through mining and drilling, as natural emulsion springs were rare. Originally discovered by an oil exploration drill on the planet Sarah, the discovery of the substance and its use as a fuel played a key role in Saren and Locust history. Control of emulsion was the main cause of the Pendulum Wars, which weakened humanity's unity, but it gave them the strength to fight the Locust Horde on Emergence Day. Now the origin of emulsion itself remains a mystery. It is unknown if it has existed on Sarah since the first origins of life, or it somehow developed or was introduced during human history. However, it is most likely possible it was developed during prehistoric Sarah when riftworms were active in creating the hollow and their excrement allowed for the creation of life in the hollow, possibly creating emulsion from the riftworms. 
Of course, emotion does have a huge presence in the Gears of War universe, from influencing the Pendulum Wars to causing lambency, in which what forced the Locust to begin Emergence Day as they were losing the Lambent War in the Hollow, all the way to the Emotion Countermeasure weapon being deployed by Adam Phoenix, 17 years after Emergence Day, which resulted in the death of Adam Phoenix himself, the Countermeasure weapon killed off Emotion, and any life form heavily colonised by Emotion, while those less infected, were cured of their affliction. The Locust Cedars were large, eight-legged beasts that fired Nemesis spores out of a second mouth on their rear end. When the Locust Horde deployed Cedars onto the battlefield, they used these creatures as artillery and anti-air weapon emplacements. They have also been known to jam radio transmissions with their very presence. Cedars are perhaps the most bizarre creatures of the Locust Horde, and the most bizarre hollow creature for that matter. Each of these living cannons are literally fed its own ammunition, and the mouth on its rear is the creature's anus and the Nemesists were flying organic matters that were released by a Cedar's secondary mouth, and they would make a beeline for the nearest enemy unit. It was very deadly against Cog Gear Squads or King Ravens, and they also seemed to affect radio transmissions, even homing into jacks. When not used as an anti-air or mortar shell, Nemesists could hover in mid-air, dispersing noxious ink into the air to scramble radio transmissions, deny airspace for King Ravens, or to hamper targeting data transmissions to Hammer of Dawn satellites, preventing their use. However, Nemesis have minimal armour, small arms fire seems to be the quickest solution when taking on the Nemesis from the air. Another side note is that the ink grenade is a Nemesis infant, housed inside an incendiary grenade casing. But the adult Nemesis have not shown the ability to kill opponents by poisoning them. We need to get off this thing, man! You're preaching to the choir! The Leviathan was a species of aquatic animal that lived in bodies of water in the hollows and later on the surface. These massive beasts were feared by the Locust, who wouldn't go anywhere near their territory. Several of these creatures were turned lambent during the early stages of the lambent pandemic, but some of them remained normal. The Leviathan is the apex predator in both the Inner Hollows and the Serrano Ocean, and their eggs are used as a valuable food source for humans. The Stranded, who had headed into the Hollows to seek shelter from the war, had some knowledge on them. They are absolutely huge and they have gigantic jaws and tentacles. Due to their aquatic nature, the Leviathans managed to survive and flourish in the Serrano Ocean, even with the Emotion Countermeasure weapon, suggesting that they were not as exposed as other hollow creatures to Emotion. But the Lambent Leviathans would have died off after the weapon's activation. Although still feared by fishermen, their eggs are prized food items and sold amongst humans, such as Riftworm Village, or as a prime ingredient for snacks. Also their teeth, specifically the smaller tooth of the inner jaw, was kept as trophies and display items. The Leviathan had an incredibly thick hide, capable of resisting small arms fire and explosions. Its only viable weak points were its eyes and mouth. In their natural state, they were territorial predators, only attacking those who came too close. But the Leviathans were never seen outside of the Hollow before Operation Hollow Storm. It was suggested by Marcus Phoenix that the flooding of the Hollow and sinking of Jacinto may have allowed the creatures to escape into the open water, and perhaps becoming the apex predators of the whole ocean itself. Ah, oh, crap. That boat's not getting us anywhere. Look out! Manglers were an aquatic species of the hollows and the Serrano Ocean. They lived in the ocean and underground lakes surrounding Nexus and were used by the Locust Horde. Manglers swam in large shoals and were very aggressive, but they weren't as deadly as the Leviathans. However, the sinking of Jacinto released the manglers that resided in the hollow into the Serrano Ocean, along with the Leviathans. Like most hollow creatures, the Locust Horde enslaved them for use in the war machine, so the Manglers were used to power their gunboats to get across the underground lakes surrounding Nexus and the Hollows. And the Manglers tended to be about 15 to 20 feet in length. Control, you have any info on this thing? 
Looks like a big snake or a worm made of stone. Recent intel lists it as a rock worm. Not sure if it's dangerous, but we do know it's an indigenous cave creature that feeds on plants. The rock worm was a creature that lived in the hollow. Described by Anya as an indigenous cave creature, these large, worm-like organisms slither from one tunnel to another, eating the globe fruit that grow on the cavern walls and ceiling. They are assumed harmless, but if you get in front of one of their mouths, they will bite, causing light damage. Their tough hides are impervious to gunfire, appearing like stone. They'll pretty much mind their own business, unless you get in their way. If you stand in front of their faces, then they will attack you and they were around 25 to 30 feet in length. During Operation Hollow Storm, it was revealed that locusts hunt these creatures for food. Cantus priests can control rockworms and tickers with their strange chants. As part of the locust hunting ritual, a cantus would lure a rockworm out with these chants for locust hunting parties. They would then be slaughtered and have their meat carved up by the locust butchers. The locust horde also had a rockworm slaughterhouse where they would transport and slaughter the rockworms so the rockworms were a tasty feast for the locust horde. It is presumed that most, if not all of the rockworms, along with any other creature native to the hollows, were killed by the sinking of Jacinto. If there were any survivors, their fate remains unknown. It is unlikely that these creatures had any contact with emulsion and therefore didn't perish when the emulsion countermeasure weapon was activated. But as stated before, it remains unknown whether any worms or any other native to the hollows survived. Is that you? Marcus, we got more locusts on the way! Ty, let's go! Cole, Baird, cover that door! Carmine, Dom, guard the rear! Ty! No! I told you, they're breaking people! I can hear them screaming from the docks! I can't believe they did that to Ty. He, he survives everything, doesn't he? Let's just get the hell out of here. The Torture Barge, or Beast Barge, was a hollow creature turned into a mobile prison. They were first known to the Sirens during Operation Hollow Storm, being used as a prison for processed gears and stranded. The Beast Barge was able to climb atop the ceilings in the hollow to quickly transport prisoners for the processes. It was slow in speed and the creature itself had four enormous legs. It also had armor plating and on board it had one driver, one gunner and dozens of prison guards. The torture barge's superstructure was split into three primary decks. The boarding deck, the torture deck and the roof deck. The boarding deck is the first deck used by locusts and their prisoners to go on board the barge to be later processed. As this deck is hung beneath the creature, one elevator is used at the back of the deck to transport two personnel into the main torture deck. The torture deck is the second level and the largest this is where dozens upon dozens of human prisoners are sent to be processed, either in prisons or in a torture pod. The torture deck has an inclining slope, which leads to the roof deck. So the roof deck is the third level and is where a Troika heavy machine gun is mounted at the back of the barge. This is also where the barge's control switch is located, which prods the beast to its direct location. Now those are all of the hollow creatures that we've seen in the Gears of War universe, but there are some honourable mentions of other hollow creatures seen in the Gears of War universe. These included rock shrews, 
which were small subterranean mole-like mammals, which were pretty much at the bottom of the food chain. We'd also see bats flying around the hollows, as well as tiny purple beetles and so on. So that is the lore behind every single hollow creature in the Gears of War universe. So if you enjoyed this video, be sure to smash a like on the video, and subscribe if you're new to the channel for more similar lore content. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll catch you next time. Thank <laughs> you.